Okay, so thank you very much uh, for choosing to be at this room to see this presentation. Um, can, can I just very quickly ask you, who is a visitor? Who is not Portuguese? Okay, th thank you so much. Just for me to have an idea of the ratio of visitors versus uh, Portuguese community. So I start by the last slide, which is thank you. I think we need to be thankful for, uh, for the work that has been done with Ubuntu. We should be thankful to Canonical and to the community. It's, uh, it's in our opinion, uh, game-changing, as, as Tiago said before. And that's why uh, we say that we are at the 10th of October of uh, year 15 after Ubuntu. This is a way of saying that uh, it's, it's been a game changer and it really makes a difference. Uh, I'm here representing Angle Solid or in English Solid Angle, which is a, a, a small boutique specialized company that provides services uh, that are based in Ubuntu and many other open source components. Therefore, our interest in Ubuntu, its past, its history, and its future. Um, <clears throat> we are probably the only Portuguese company that invests in uh, Ubuntu desktop, in services provided uh, related to the Ubuntu desktop. And this is an important thing for us. It's not our, um, I would not say it's now our, not the largest chunk of our business. It's an important slice. And it's something that we like since the beginning. You will find other companies who will do Linux desktop if somebody really, really, really asks them. Uh, they will not do it as well because it takes a, lo a long time to get the necessary skills to work with the desktop, which is very different from the cloud, the Internet of Things, everything else. So this is something we are very interested at. So Ubuntu is born in year zero, 15 years ago. Before of that, uh, the desktop was ancient. Now it's modern. One of my favorite um, concepts from Ubuntu is the 100 paper cuts concept because it gave name to a problem that existed. So in ancient uh, Linux desktop, we would die out of 100 paper cuts. Is everyone familiar with this expression? Just one person is familiar. Two, three, three people. So it's like when you cut yourself with a paper, it's very annoying when you cut yourself with a sheet of paper you don't die, but if maybe if you have 100 of those cuts, you, you can actually die. So this concept, I think, was introduced by Mark Shuttleworth. I'm not absolutely sure, but uh, uh, there's, there's an online link about this, the 100 paper cuts campaign. It has to do with the 100 or more micro problems that uh, the Linux desktop had and that Ubuntu tried and to a certain point succeeded uh, to improve. So modern desktop has only maybe 47 paper cuts. You don't knife, don't knife for it. Uh, but there's still a lot of work to do uh, in polishing, integration, in providing same defaults, etc. And this is a topic that interests us. This 100 paper cuts metaphor uh, is explained in that URL. But essentially, as I said, um, it is something that existed that just didn't have a name, and uh, having a name for things is important when we need to refer to them. So this is, in our opinion, uh, one of the best concepts, one of the best contributions in terms of concept. <clears throat> what are these paper cuts, clearly, uh, concretely? I, I could put uh, uh, 100 slides of them or more, because we've been cut by all of them, and it's not like, you just cut yourself. Uh, it's when you provide Linux desktop to users, you cut yourself 100 times, times the number of users you put your system to. So therefore, uh, we've been extremely affected by this. And we could just give you some examples of how historically this was. So back in 2004, 2005, uh, a Linux distribution was uh, a power pack with many things inside. Uh, that was not optimized for anything. So it was very usual that you would double click on a media file and it would open in one player, another media file would open in another. End users do not accept this. But of course, uh, 
the community by then had no sensitivity to realize the importance of these things. And you would get answers like, hey, just change the corresponding desktop files and the file association will change. Another recurring topic is why if I right click on a file and uh, um, select open with and put some application, it never works, for example, if the file names have spaces. It sounds like a joke now, but by then, this was normal. The answer by then was usually, don't do it. Who, uh, who would put spaces on a file name? Nobody does it. So we have many, many other examples of this that I could put on the slides. Uh, I just put two to not annoy you too much. But the idea which I want to, to transmit here is that this was reality and there wasn't a community that understood the importance of these things. I, I remember that with that other distribution that we worked with before Ubuntu, um, we opened the meta bug report with, with like a list of, of, of these integration problems and they told us to open 100 bug reports instead because you cannot just open a bug report to report several things. Of course, those 100 would be completely um, ignored because individually they were not important. Uh, what made them important was that there were so many. So these are the things that communities have trouble to understand and the Linux community was no exception. And I think that Ubuntu really helped in trying to get people to understand how, how a desktop should be done, um, at least in this regard. I, I will go forward to other things. To summarize, uh, Linux distributions before Ubuntu were like a Swiss army knife. We think usually of a Swiss army knife romantically as if it was a great tool, but it's actually an awful tool. It's a tool that does many jobs, but it does not do any job particularly well. So, while a Swiss army knife can take us out of trouble in many situations, we don't want to do our daily things with a Swiss army knife. We want a tool which is optimized for the job. So we, if we want to have an operating system, either a desktop or a server, or something for embedded hardware, etc., we don't want it to come with everything uh, inside, seven, seven gigabytes of things which are not necessary. We want it to have just enough, and the just enough which is inside should be tightly integrated. So this is the metaphor uh, that I think explains the shift that we've seen from the seven gigabytes power pack DVD to a more streamlined distribution that has different versions, server, desktop, uh, like Ubuntu has, which is a very good thing, rather than a generic installer where you choose which components you want to put, and in the end you have something which is not tightly integrated. So we are very thankful for this. We think, so in short, we think that Ubuntu has streamlined the desktop to a certain extent. And also, uh, I think Ubuntu did a great contribution, which is commoditizing virtual servers. So Ubuntu became very popular in the cloud, in AWS, in DigitalOcean, in Azure. Even Microsoft admits that more than 40% of the, of the virtual machines are running uh, Ubuntu. I'm not sure if it's 40% running Linux or Ubuntu specifically, but, but Ubuntu is for sure the most popular uh, virtual server on the cloud. So these two contributions uh, are very, very good. What's the worst concept from Ubuntu, uh, in, our, in our opinion? Sorry about this, I, I, I apologize, but it's our opinion. It's Unity. I mean, Unity is not, is not bad, it's, or it wasn't bad, it still exists, it's not bad. And it's not me saying this, because my, my personal opinion is totally irrelevant, because I do not represent uh, the users that we should be targeting. It's just that it was too different and not mind-blowing, mind-blowingly better. Um, it was kind of okay, but different. And, and this is a problem. Historically, uh, both with Linux distributions and with uh, desktop environments, we had this. We had a paradox of choice. So 
we have the dominating player in the market, the big slice, and then we have Linux with a, a, a partition of a, a very large number of different options. Did we actually need one more? If we needed one more, it would have to be so, so much better that all the others would become irrelevant. We had one more, but it was not particularly spectacular. So Unity, in our opinion, was controversial in the Linux community because it was not what they already were kind of comfortable with. No more KDE or uh, whatever they liked. It was yet another. And it was unfamiliar to normal users because it, it uh, is built on a different desktop metaphor than most people are used, which should be the Windows desktop metaphor, which is not bad. Uh, it might not be optimal, but it's what people are used to. Um, so, so it kind of introduced something which was odd for both, for both types of users. You might be asking, what do we know? What does this guy know? Uh, who are these guys who are saying these things? This is from 2005. It's, it was our um, quality assurance spreadsheet that we used to fine tune a Linux distribution to our first Linux desktop customer, which had 20 uh, something users. In 2005, things were more difficult than they are now. But even, even without that name, we were getting rid of the 1,000 paper cuts um, by doing this, quality assurance on integration. Um, and by then, it was necessary to support all the video formats that we can imagine, because by then, offline video was very important, to integrate applications, to make sure that uh, Firefox uh, uses the same file associations than the desktop environment, for example, which was something that was not you know, a promise from any distribution. It could perfectly be the case that the browser does not open the right application, the same one as the desktop. So we, we had to work to make sure it happened. I mean, so many things to make the desktop usable. By putting the desktop to work with real users, uh, I mean, not technical people like we are, but, you know, normal people which are not... Uh, specially motivated to use a different system. They just have to do their work. We learned um, how things, how they think and how things need to work for them. So the reason we are Hello? Okay, so pit stop. So it means you heard nothing from what I said? Okay, what was the last thing that I said that you could hear? Previous slide. Okay. Is this working now? Cheers, thank you. Um, <clears throat> So next, next time I will try to wire the microphone that wires me directly to the wall. <laughs> it's always more reliable than batteries. So as I was saying, um, why, do, why, why do we feel we can have strong opinions about this? Because we, we had to learn um, by practice. Because since 2005, we started putting Linux desktop in the hands of regular people. I mean, not technical guys, not system administrations, the regular people that do marketing, management, accounting, whatever. <clears throat> so this is how our first desktop looked like before Ubuntu. We even have a fake Internet Explorer icon, which launched Firefox, just to make people familiar with. Of course, we did not distribute this you know, widely, otherwise we'd have been sued, but you get the concept. People need to be familiar. And this was KDE uh, 3.5, if I remember correctly, um, which people adapted to quite nicely. 
So when, is, when we say Linux for human beings, do we mean Linux for extremely rational human beings who are also deeply motivated to use free software? Or do we mean Linux for human beings in general? Because it's completely different. Uh, if, if we mean Linux for human beings in general, we need to think how human beings in general think, and we need to be ready to serve them. Historically, uh, the community did not have the right stance to do this. Um, and, and that's also why we are trying to convey this message. If we are targeting human beings in general, uh, we need to pick our fights. I give you one example. It's already radical if they are changing operating system, if they are adopting Linux. Do we really, really need to change their desktop metaphor? Maybe, maybe we don't. Maybe we need to choose to have one fight instead of two, because maybe we can win one fight, but we cannot win both at the same time. I'm connecting this uh, to the choice of using Unity uh, rather than, than other things, for example, KDE. One thing that I, um, I think is a, a very common misconception in technical communities uh, is about innovation. Innovation is overrated. It is not that well valued by regular people. Regular people will accept innovation if it comes from a player that spends millions in marketing. Otherwise, if it's innovation just for the sake of it, uh, it will not be valued, usually. What people want is bow. They want their business as usual. So you, if you want, and they also want, want short-term comfort. So if you are changing the operating system that you give them, you should minimize the friction points. Because one, they are not motivated for a change unless you are addressing a problem that they have. And regular people don't have a problem with a system that crashes once per day because they already have that at home. For them, it's their concept. They, they, they will maybe value it in the midterm, but the midterm is also an overrated because people usually, regular people, put more emphasis in the short term. So we need for people to accept a different system, we need to make it in a way that it is short term friendly. And to be short term friendly, we need to minimize the difference. Okay? So that's why um, we are the 1%. Because we, we, we as the community, which I am also part of, because we made these mistakes, we are still the 1%, um, the 1%, the desktop Linux users in the world, according to statistics. It might be 1.5 or 1.9, depending on, the, on who, who, counts, uh, who counts it, but it's nearly 1%. You probably know this. Is everyone familiar with this picture? No one is familiar with this picture. This is from the matrix. Everyone is familiar with the matrix, number one, the only one that matters. So this is, this is the scene where Morpheus introduces Neo to regular people, well, to human beings. And when he says, most people uh, will, will defend the system with their own lives. They are not ready to be disconnected. These people, are the people that we need to be targeting if we want, if we want desktop to succeed. Uh, <clears throat> put this in perspective. How much market share does Apple have? Apple has roughly 90% of desktop market share, even with the absolute best combination of software and hardware. Even with tight control of the product they deliver, by making the hardware themselves and by fine-tuning the operating system to work perfectly out of the box with that hardware. And, they st and they've been doing this for years with this level of delivery and they have 9%. nine percent. So do we think that without uh, manufacturer support, without uh, uh, mainstream distribution channel support, we could get away with something which is too different? The thing is, there are enough wars to fight, 
So providing, providing a desktop that is not too different was for sure, in my opinion, one of the most important things. Uh, how can we summarize this? I don't know if you are, is everyone familiar with the hot crazy scale metaphor from Friends? It's a very known, it's a very known sketch from, from that series. Um, if something is in, in technology for normal people, if something is 10% different, it needs to be 1000% hotter. And there was not the case with Unity. It was maybe 50% different and as hot as something that there was before. So that's one, one, one way to summarize, in my opinion, why it was not a particularly good choice. KDE was by then uh, a couple of paper cuts away. It had maybe five bugs that needed to be fixed. With minimal effort, we could have had KDE as the default Ubuntu desktop, and we would have had, um, well, a version of Linux that was more suitable for, generically speaking, human beings than what we had. Of course, it's very easy to be, uh, it's very easy to be a decision maker years after the decisions were done. So I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to play that role. Uh, I'm trying to convey here a message um, in the lessons learned, uh, in the lessons learned kind of, kind of way. It could have been a Linux test tipping point or not. We will never know. Uh, many things, many things happen uh, due to a particular conspiracy of conditions. So we know that Apple failed to become mainstream, at least that it's what I read in the biography of Steve Jobs, because he refused to sign a contract with IBM because it had 100 pages and he missed, missed, he missed his opportunity. Um, we know that um, we now have competition in, in, you know, mobile phones with two operating systems because uh, Ubuntu made, uh, because Google made a very quick move and uh, put Android in several hardware manufacturers in a short amount of time, just like this. Nobody knew, nobody talked, out of a sudden it was everywhere. So some things are made of tipping points. We don't know if this would be the case, if a better let desktop had been chosen, maybe we would have 2% or 3% market share. I don't know, I have no idea, it's impossible to know. What we know is that we might have missed the opportunity because by then uh, Windows XP really, really sucked. It was embarrassing. If we could have had a great Linux available by then uh, that was friendly to people, it would, could have made a big difference. Right now, uh, the Windows operating system sucks way less than it sucked by then. So the opportunity that we have is not comparable to what we had by then. Furthermore, now there's much more mobile devices uh, and mobile traffic on the internet than what comes from desktops, and desktops is, are, are more and more being regarded as, uh, you know, boring work tools, not the things that people want to use daily. So I don't think we will have the same opportunity again. What's important from this is uh, try, trying to think of the mindset which is necessary if we want to work with normal people, that is the majority. Uh, so I, I think mobile, mo mobile was uh, uh, a really different story and uh, with Android, where Linux is kind of a success, it succeeded because um, the mainstream player, which was uh, the iPhone of course, was not yet completely uh, delivered to the masses. It was in, in the process. Um, so there was like a big, a big hole, a big space to fill in. It's, diff it's different, even though in many ways Android sucks and it has the, the security of Windows 98, uh, which is really bad. There was a big, a big space to be filled, uh, and like the desktop, where we would have to like open the space away and base ourselves on the fact that uh, Windows was not good at all. So I think it's a, a little bit different. Um, that space has been filled by Android and then Ubuntu didn't manage to, to get in unfortunately because it would have been very good. But then again, that has to do with the uh, dynamics of the market, distribution, retail, etc. It's a big topic. 
So, uh, given this overview of our opinions on several uh, facets of Ubuntu, I would jump quickly to our use cases for you to know a little bit of how we work with Ubuntu. So, from expected to unexpected uses, uh, I would start first with the left side of the spectrum, which is the things you probably guess that every company that works with Ubuntu does. So we work uh, with virtual instances on, on different cloud providers. We do uh, our, own, our own virtualization systems with CloudMin. We work with the AWS, DigitalOcean, and we work, we work with Puppet to automatically configure the instances. Uh, cloud instances, but we are already expanding the use of Puppet to also configure desktops on customers that have you know, um, an important number of users. So we support network PCs with Ubuntu. Uh, this is the KDE desktop that we put uh, ourselves with lots of tweaking, uh, with the um, kind of layout that people are expecting, and with an automated installer that allows the desktop to automatically join a domain without manual intervention, without changing 50 configuration files in a way that can be used for a, a corporate deployment. Uh, we support, of course, uh, laptops for us and for our customers. There are here two examples of the laptops that we use. We use Slimbook and we use uh, Dell. And I hope we can use uh, uh, the new computer from Libre, Libre Trend, which is a sponsor of this event, once it becomes available. Is, is anyone here that has a relationship with Dell through Canonical or something? No? Because we, we had a huge fight with Dell to force them to sell Ubuntu pre-installed in Portugal. Now they sell it to us. I don't know if they sell it to other companies. Well, I had to go to the project manager. Uh, uh, I had to go to the project manager in the US to tell him that uh, the things that he's announcing do not work. And automatically they started working. So uh, I think if this message can be sent to Canonical, which like Dell does not want to cooperate unless we really force them. Uh, it, it wasn't important. Is there anyone who can take this message? Well, for your information, it's here. We also work uh, uh, with routers, which also have Ubuntu inside. We developed this, and there's Tiago, our router champion. He also likes, uh, he likes some attention in the talks. Um, <laughs> we, we released the source code uh, which is uh, basically an automated installer that you run on top of Ubuntu Server. This router uh, is a product where we lose a lot of money. It's a product that is developed to support uh, our services because it's impossible to manage the ISP routers, which are uh, problematic and uh, too diverse in terms of brands and models across several ISPs and also within the same ISP. So we have this router and it works very well comes with OpenVPN pre-installed, can join the domain if necessary, has uh, several networks, QoS, etc. You are more than welcome to take a look at the, the, the source code over there. So this is how it looks from the inside. It has Wi-Fi, three network cards, you can put an extra one if you want. We sometimes do funny things like uh, hacking a hybrid computer to put Ubuntu on it. So this is uh, an Asus transformer from a customer of ours. We hacked it to make the touch screen work, and um, we modified a little bit KDE to have some icons where they can some launch some applications more easily. This was a uh, one week project, less than that. Well, not more than one week for sure. Uh, the customer wanted it, and in the end he was happy. It's not something that we do every day, but it's sometimes fun to do. We know, we know how to edit video on Linux with Kden Live, which is an amazing uh, KD uh, video editor. I have not tried every other. I cannot say that this is the best one. I can say that this is really, really interesting and it works. So it's something that we can do. Not pro professionally, but if we had to edit a video, we don't need to open a Mac or a Windows because we know that this works. It can also be used as a streaming device because VLC allows you to connect to Chromecast and you can use uh, VLC to 
broadcast sound and video to Chromecast and maybe probably other types of devices. Uh, so this is another hybrid computer that we hacked. It's the Lenovo Mix. It's very cheap. It's around, it's around 300 euros. And uh, the installation is not very straightforward, but it can be done. So, for example, a funny use case that we had in our new office inauguration party was that we had an um, integrated DJ controller based on this, based on this device, but without, without the keyboard, um, that we could use with an open source program called uh, Mix, with three X's in the end, you probably heard of it, and it's very easy with Ubuntu, you can just uh, configure it to auto-login and auto-launch an application full screen. So it, it's can, it becomes kind of a one-use device. I did this just for fun, just, uh, um, just to demonstrate that we can do fun things with Ubuntu, even if it's not our daily work. And uh, it's really interesting because everything is open source. But this, this program is one of the most well-maintained uh, desktop uh, open source programs that I know. They're super professional in the releases. Um, I follow it because I'm, uh, I'm interested in the topic. And, um, well, we can do things that we didn't imagine. imagine. So here are some references for what I was referring to. So I would, I would summarize that we, we live off kind of a, on an open source bubble. We are a very small company, very uh, specialized. We are a niche business. So we have the privilege of uh, being able to live daily in this kind, in this kind of reality. Uh, we have an office in the Lisbon city center, which has a custom table that we had to put up with a crane. So we are a bit crazy sometimes with our projects. The DevOps that make this happen were very problematic because it's something that we do every 10 years. So it was not very optimized. We suffered a lot, but uh, everything is in place right now. Also to share that we are hiring, we are interested in talent. Um, Tiago, which is one of the main uh, Ubuntu community um, participants, is uh, our colleague. And we are very open to expand that partnership with the community. Um, by putting talent to work and providing talent um, an environment where they can work with the tools which they like. So I think it's a win-win for everyone. Um, so this is a picture of our office in the center of Lisbon. Um, and I have a challenge for the interval, which is, I mean, I'm, I'm saying all these things about Ubuntu, the, the great things, the other maybe not so great choices, Overall, the fact that it's game changer, I leave you a challenge, which uh, um, took us some time to solve. If you have a fleet of Ubuntu machines, how do you update the packages that have available security updates of importance, high or critical? How do you do that? Um, because you know, you cannot just apt update all the machines because it's risky. If you update 100 packages, you don't know what's going to break. Um, on the same, uh, but, but at the same time, the machines are not all the same, so the list of packages that you decide to update is not the same on, on every machine. And if you run apt install with a list that includes things which are not installed, they're going to get installed, and you don't want it because you should run, you should have there just enough to make it work. You don't want extra things. So. Uh, if you want to discuss this in the interval, uh, it's, it's an interesting challenge. I think, I think we solved it. Uh, I don't know if in the most elegant way. Maybe there was some more obvious way that you can share with us. We will be more than happy um, to talk about this. And it's also an excuse to engage in a funny conversation. So, guys, thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. If you need anything from us, please feel free to contact. Thank you. Please bring them on. What, one question, please. I challenge you to put one question. Okay. Go ahead, Andre. Why still using Puppet instead of Ansible? Well, it, it works very well. And we have um, 
a huge uh, module of configurations uh, that works with Puppet. So I mean, historical reasons and also the fact that it works. Thank you. Okay, we have one more question over there. Andre, you have broken the ice, so now we have questions because of you. Thank you. Yeah, all right. Uh, what uh, was the problem with the what you had with Dell when you ordered? Because uh, we we tend to use uh, we tend to order. We are a, a group of developers. We usually order from them with Ubuntu pre-installed pre on their Express machines. And it, it, uh, Th thank you for asking that. Yeah. Dell uh, said the product didn't exist. Okay. So the product is is or at least was on the website. You know, Dell.pt then many slashes uh, away, there was the Dell XPS 13. Uh, we have some of them here with our team. Ah, okay, uh, yeah. I, I see it was uh, on the on the Portu Portugal on side. The? It was on the Portuguese side. When you, when you had to order the XPS, it was kind of... No, you, you they don't sell you directly uh, ah. from the website in okay. Portugal. So ah, you need to okay. go to a representative. Then yeah. And then they say it, it doesn't exist. Um, and then why, when I contact the project manager that runs the project Sputnik uh, project, which is Ubuntu on Dell, um, it's, he's called Barton George. Um, I had a telco with him and I told him, so you are announcing this on your blog, including availability in Portugal. Why are they telling me that this does not exist? Suddenly it, it existed. But I think um, many other companies are getting no's and they think it's not possible because Dell is giving this answer. We can now speak for ourselves. We can order as many as we like because somehow they uh, whitelisted the part number for us. But wh what I think is a, a, is a real shame is all, all the others getting no's. Because of what? I don't know what's their agenda. I, I really think that, that Canonical should, should review this situation and make sure that they cannot say no uh, because the offer exists, the product exists, and it works well. So. If, there, if there's someone um, in Canonical I should talk to, please, guys, let me know. I will be more than glad to, to report. We are in, very interested in this product and in general in having uh, pre-installed Linux. It's, it's, it saves half of the, of the integration work that at least the hardware works well. So, so please let me know if we should talk to someone else about this. Okay, one more question. <clears throat> Hi, this is a little um, follow-up to the previous question regarding the laptops with Ubuntu pre-installed situation. Um, we are fortunately starting to see other companies starting to do the same thing. Uh, we heard about Lenovo starting to uh, ship uh, new laptops with Ubuntu pre-installed. And I know that they are also selling them in Portugal. Uh, I do uh, agree with you with the Dell situation. I know of people that heard about the Dell laptop, tried to buy, uh, to buy them. They got a no. They didn't uh, press the issue any further. And there's uh, a space loss in there. So my question is, do you would you consider changing to another provider if the new provider of laptops would give you the same level of uh, maintenance to the hardware with uh, Ubuntu Pre installed uh, on, on the hardware? Do you think it, it, it's, I mean, do you see there's a market need for this to happen with more transparency and do you see it as a good enough factor to actually change uh, when you are already a Dell customer? We reevaluate these things regularly. It, it cannot be, they cannot be reevaluated every week because otherwise you, you, you work, you are, you're running on a moving target. So we need the, we, we did the significant number of uh, Dell laptop purchases which need to be maintained um, and a very big diversity of models is not good but we will reevaluate re from time to time. W what I think needs to happen is that there needs to be pressure um, from other companies and individuals to make things happen. I am very stubborn. 
I am really, really stubborn. When I think I'm right, I take, I take things until the end. So I, I really had to push a lot to make it happen. And now it happens smoothly. Now, if people just take a no and they go away, um, things will never change. And we are, we are a small company. I cannot speak for the market in, in, in regard. I mean, I cannot say how much demand there is. Um, all I can say is that sometimes there are tipping points. If you have 100 people pushing, it's like the 100 paper cuts. You can kill the problem. Um, so take this message maybe to one soul and see if you can organize to make it happen. But then th there's also another thing. People should not be cheap, um, especially companies. So I had this, I had this uh, discussion with, in the Association of Companies, ESOP, and they were like, yeah, yeah, but those laptops are uh, uh, expensive. I mean, they, they, are, they are the price they are. Um, they are. They are good laptops. If we want at the same time to buy a 400 euros laptop and force the, the provider to have Linux on it, um, it's not going to work because their profit margins are very, very small. So this is a product for developers, which is expensive, I agree. Uh, we are investing uh, uh, in our team to, to, to have uh, good equipment. If, if the businesses do not also invest on providers, which, which put Linux on the equipment, and they say, okay, I'll just buy the cheaper, the cheapest one in the market and then install Linux on top. It can be done, but then, you know, you are not like feeding the ecosystem. So this, this should be considered, in my opinion, we should explicitly support with our wallets the companies which are providing Linux pre-installed. Any more questions? I hope I have answered, uh, Markus. Any more questions? Okay. So, thank you very much once again. Uh, we can also talk in the interval. Thank you very much.